Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. Thank you for joining us and welcome to our new series or our continuous series of virtual symposia from Chemistry Europe. We're very happy that we can continue to bring this to you in 2021. And the first one this year is uh, from Batteries and Supercups, organized together with Professor Stefan Kaskel. Uh, and it's on the research on lithium metal anodes. So we have three uh, great speakers today, Alberto Vauzi, Celine Bachas, and Holger Alpheus. And I will pass on um, the mic to Professor Gaskell. But before I do that, I would like to give you a few um, tips on how we're going to be organizing this event today. So we will have each speaker giving a presentation and afterwards there will be some time for questions and answers. So whenever you have a question to the speakers, please post them on the chat function. I hope you can all see that. And also if you have any, any questions on technical issues because you cannot hear or you cannot see anything, also post them there. Uh, my colleague, colleague Ananias and I will be trying to answer to all of your questions. So, uh, Professor Stefan Gaskell, I will just give an introduction <laughs> to him. So he uh, studied chemistry and received his PhD degree in 1997 at Eberhard Karls University in Tübingen, Tübingen in Germany. He was a Federlinen Fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and he worked with John Corbett at AMPS lab, Laboratory in the US from 1998 to 2000 on intermetallic compounds. He was a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for, uh, for Kohlen Forschung in Mülheim an der Ruhr from 2000 to 2014 in the group of Ferdi Schutz. And after his habilitation at the Ruhr Universität in Bochum in 2004 um, in the area of heterogeneous catalysis, he became a full professor of inorganic chemistry at the Technical University in Dresden, where he currently is. Since 2008, he's also business field uh, leader at the Fraunhofer Institute for, for Metal and Beam Technology in Dresden. His research interests are focused on porous and nanostructure materials, uh, synthesis, structure and functions for energy applications in energy storage devices, catalysis, batteries and separation technologies. So thank you very much, Stefan, for helping us today and for joining us. So I will just now give the mic to you. Yeah, Rosalba, thank you very much. It's my great honor to chair this uh, session here today. And thank you for this long introduction. Actually, today it's not about me. Uh, it's about lithium metal research. And we have three great speakers today. First of all, I would uh, want to say that I hope you are all healthy. Uh, we wish you all good health all over the world in the different countries. We know how difficult the situation is. And some people are in the lockdown, cannot access the laboratory. So we are sorry about that, but um, we hope that this event will enhance the exchange and help to exchange science um, in between the different nations and keep the discussion on because of the difficulties with uh, conferences these days. So we are focusing today on a really hot topic in the area of lithium ion batteries, the lithium metal anode uh, with many challenges, of course, known for a long time, but now slowly entering the markets and new uh, prototype batteries, pouch cells come up with a uh, significantly enhanced specific energy um, enabled by lithium metal anodes. And uh, also, of course, uh, in the area of solid state batteries, this is an, a very important topic. And um, this is the reason why we have focused on this uh, topic. And um, I'm looking forward to the discussion with uh, all of you today, uh, how we can advance this topic together. So we have three speakers today, and uh, we will start with Alberto Vasi. I will briefly introduce him. Uh, it's my great uh, pleasure to have you here today. Alberto Vasi studied chemistry of materials at the University of Bologna in Italy and graduated in 2008. And then he received a PhD from the University of Ulm at the Center for Solar Energy and Hydrogen Research in Baden-Württemberg, uh, the famous ZSW, ZSW, um, which is one of the major centers for battery research in Germany. After a postdoctoral period at the Mead Center, which is another famous battery center in Germany at the University of Münster, uh, he became senior scientist at the Helmholtz Institute 
uh, of the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT. And uh, he's well established in the field of lithium uh, ion batteries, especially focusing on lithium metal anodes, but also lithium ion and all solid state lithium metal based uh, batteries. And he's also working on electrochemical double layer capacitors. And uh, today, this presentation is entitled Tailoring the Interface of Lithium and Lithium Alloy Anodes. And uh, I think we should not lose more time and we should go straight to science. And I'm very much looking forward to your presentation, Alberto. Well, thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for the very kind introduction. I hope you can see very well my screen. Yeah. I will now share it in a full screen mode. Looks very good. Very, very well. Well, as I said, thanks very much for the kind introduction. <clears throat> it's a pleasure for me also to to be part of this of this event. And um, and as I said, as you said today, I would like to give an overview on the work we've been doing at the Helmholtz Institute Ulm with regards to the development of um, uh, of suitable interfaces for. Um, uh, for lithium metal and also for lithium uh, alloy anodes. <clears throat> I feel like explaining the, the relevance of uh, introducing lithium metal batteries and the benefits of uh, lithium metal, for example, co compared to graphite, would be somehow redundant. Uh, it's it's a r relatively established uh, <clears throat> knowledge. And uh, therefore, rather than talking about why, I would rather like to discuss when and how we could finally uh, achieve lithium metal batteries. And uh, to do so, I would like to show um, a graph that, uh, a nice figure that was um, uh, recently published in a review by Professor Hong Li, which very clearly depicts the temporal evolution of lithium ion battery chemistry, including future development. And <laughs> in particularly, it is evident that in order to somehow exceed these 300 watt hour per kilogram, uh, a breakthrough is required, uh, in particular with regards to, to high capacity anodes such as silicon and lithium metal. And indeed, uh, worldwide, uh, several uh, R&D programs have been launched uh, to ac accelerate this transition, such as, for example, the Made in China 2025, the USA Battery 500, the Rising 2 in Japan. <clears throat> and in Europe also, um, the Set Plan Action uh, 7 is pushing towards this transition to lithium metal anodes, starting from uh, 2025 with the introduction of Generation 4 cells and um, ultimately uh, reaching the generation five, for example, with lithium sulfur and, and lithium air. As you can see, there is a quite well agreement worldwide that the target is uh, to reach the, the 500 uh, watt hour uh, per kilogram. And um, well, now of course, it's not a trivial task to enable lithium uh, anode uh, uh, batteries. And well, scientists have been struggling uh, with lithium uh, metal for decades. <clears throat> and in a very, a very comprehensive review uh, published a couple of years ago by uh, Professor Cui, the, 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 the multiple issues of, of lithium metal were nicely summarized um, in this picture, which depicts the, also the interplay between the different effects and uh, the very complicated the scenarios. And despite this, <clears throat> very intricate puzzle, um, all the issues uh, could uh, eventually be uh, tracked down to two main uh, uh, effects, which are the high reactivity of lithium and the infinite volume change. And uh, it goes without saying that having an in a stable interface between the lithium metal and the electrolyte be becomes therefore uh, crucial. And in a recent uh, focus review, what we've done it was to try to put together, um, to, to summarize which are the, the most common approaches to stabilizing lithium metal anodes. And one option, of course, is to 
uh, employ solid state electrolyte, either being uh, polymeric or inorganic. And uh, despite some very, very exciting results, which have been uh, recently shared, for example, by QuantumScape, it isn't yet clear whether uh, these uh, amazing results at the, um, at, uh, in, in small cells can be really translated uh, into uh, an upscaled uh, product and with which uh, time frame. On the other hand, stabilizing the, the, the interface of lithium metal anode is, is necessarily required if we want to use uh, liquid electrolytes. And uh, where practically there's no physical barrier against uh, dendrite penetration beside the porous um, separator. And in this case, we, have, uh, we can have uh, three main options. I mean, still, of course, it's, it's a simplification, but I mean, three main pathways. The first of which is the development of a stable host where we can uh, reversibly uh, plate and strip uh, lithium without uh, uh, dendrite uh, growth. The second one would be the formation of a, of a in situ SEI or also called in vivo, let's say, where the, the SEI is formed uh, via suitable electrolytes or additives um, in the cell. And finally, uh, the, uh, the, uh, another approach could be the application of an ex situ SEI. So <clears throat> something that is, uh, applied on the lithium surface before um, cell assembly, for example. And today would, uh, I would like to report some activities with the, we've done at HIU uh, with regards to these two main approaches. So um, <coughs> in situ and ex situ artificial SEI. <coughs> so as I said, ex situ artificial SEI is formed before lithium comes in contact with the electrolyte and here we could envision two main strategies. We can either, for example, use gaseous precursor, as it is the case um, for uh, chemical vapor deposition uh, techniques like uh, atomic layer deposition, or we can even uh, use liquid precursor, where uh, we treat the lithium metal surface in a solution of uh, SEI precursor and uh, a su suitable solvent. And one very elegant example of this uh, liquid SEI precursor route was uh, reported a few years back by uh, Professor Nazar, uh, where by treating the lithium metal surface, uh, by, uh, by treating lithium metal in a metal chloride solution, demonstrated that it is possible to establish an artificial SEI <coughs> composed by lithium chloride, which practically blocks the electron conduction and therefore somehow suppresses the, the, the electrolyte decomposition and the SEI growth. And a lithium metal um, um, alloy layer, which provides, uh, providing a fast and homogeneous lithium flux through the interface and therefore uh, further suppressing the, um, the, the lithium dendrite growth. Now, we have at HIU, we have tried to expand on this subject and selected um, zinc chloride as uh, uh, inorganic solvents as our um, SEI uh, precursor solution uh, in order to, to establish uh, a lithium zinc alloy layer. And we have tried to systematically investigate, uh, for example, in particular, the influence of the zinc chloride concentration so the concentration of the of the metal chloride uh, in solution as well as the influence of the organic solvent that you use to prepare your um, your SEI precursor <clears throat> now as easy as it seems directly dipping the lithium metal foil as received let's say into the precursor solution leads to very poor results and in fact, in this way, the SEI is just, the artificial SEI is just formed on top of, of the native SEI. And the native SEI is relatively known to be mostly uh, constituted by lithium oxide, lithium hydroxide, and lithium uh, carbonate. <coughs> However, 
of course the the the, the composition and uh, the ratio between these layers depends uh, also on the lithium production and storage condition of the of the of the lithium metal and <clears throat> This layer somehow makes it, uh, as you can see from the SEM EDX mapping, very difficult uh, to obtain homogeneous coating. And here you can see uh, very well that there are some zinc-rich uh, regions, some zinc-rich island, which only partially cover the lithium su surface. So, um, of course, uh, applying a... a uh, um, let's say controlling the morphology and the composition of the artificial SEI uh, requires uh, a, contr uh, a very detailed control of the of the surface underneath. So the, the the surface of the lithium must be cleaned. Now the easiest and most straightforward thing you can do to generate a fresh and clean lithium surface in the lab without let's say having any uh, substantial effect, for example, from the operator, is to start from a lithium rod and to directly uh, slice the lithium rod, for example, with a couple of tungsten wires, into directly uh, into the SEI precursor solution. And this is a schematic of the um, very easy schematic of the tool that we have in the lab. Of course, everything is done in an inert environment inside the glove box. And from the from the images here, you can clearly appreciate uh, the difference between, for example, a lithium rod which is sliced without any SEI precursor solution, very shiny and clean. And this is the SEM surface, extremely smooth, and uh, one which is uh, instead uh, um, cut um, in, in uh, one molar zinc chloride uh, in THF, and where you can see the artificial SEI formed on the surface. Now, if we look a little bit more in, in detail at the SEM uh, morphology, um, you can see here the influence of zinc chloride concentration on the morphology. And um, in all cases, uh, we can see that we can achieve an effective coverage of the surface with respect to the to the pristine lithium. Although the treatment with the most co most concentrated one molar zinc chloride solution uh, provides results on a, on a better uniformity of the surface, and the artificial SEI appears to be uh, constituted by micro-sized particles, which range from um, around 0.2 micron to 1 micron. And if we look at the EDX mapping, we can see that, for example, we have we have uh, these brighter particles which have, um, do not contain any zinc, most likely lithium chloride, <coughs> are embedded into a kind of matrix uh, which is zinc rich and would be, uh, therefore, the lithium zinc alloy and probably some zinc chloride precursor um, left over. If we look at the uh, XPS analysis of the surface, we can uh, also clearly um, see that uh, the surface uh, composition is rather comparable uh, in all the three um, uh, different um, uh, concentration for the precursor. So the concentration does not seem to affect much uh, the compounds which are formed on the surface, which are always the lithium zinc alloy we always we uh, we we always observe as it which is com somehow in agreement with the previous results of um, of uh, the Nazar paper. We also see lithium chloride, um, both in the chlor chlorine and lithium spectrum. And the, both the carbon and the lithium um, uh, region evidence the presence of carbonaceous compound, which again are in line with Nazar work and tes testify that the role uh, of the solvent is also important, as for example, the solvent is the only um, carbon source in the in the system, and we can clearly see here the formation of some uh, of some lithium carbonate and some uh, uh, other organic components. In terms of electrochemistry, um, what we did first, of course, uh, was to assemble some symmetric lithium, lithium cells. And uh, we have measured the impedance response over, over the OCV for eight days. So we call it this 
aging test. And you can clearly see that um, upon the initial aging, uh, the pristine lithium surface um, readily react with the electrolyte, leading to a substantial increased um, interfacial resistance over time. Uh, while the, the impedance increase is remarkably reduced uh, in case uh, of uh, an artificial SEI, which is also evident from, uh, from the substantially more stable voltage profile upon uh, uh, repeated uh, stripping plating test. However, again, we do not really identify any clear influence of the concentration, at, at least not uh, on, a, on a short term. Um, the solvent has also um, a, a quite a substantial role. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we have uh, looked at four different solvents or mixtures of solvents, so THF, um, EMC, a mixture of ECPC, and, and DMC, and overall, together with, with THF, EMC uh, is the one that provides the lowest interfacial resistance values. However, as you can see from the profile, the, uh, the stripping plating uh, profile appears to be a little bit unstable, and the polarization is somehow growing uh, upon, uh, um, upon repeated stripping and plating. Uh, if we look at the morphology, we can see that <clears throat> while THF, DMC, and ECPC provide a fairly uniform surface coverage, the interface generated in EMC, uh, in the EMC-based um, <clears throat> precursor solution, it's rem relatively uneven, uh, with clear uh, carbon-rich and zinc-free regions, uh, which may... Uh, uh, display different reactivity towards the electrolyte and therefore in turn explain this uh, unstable potential profile that we observed before. Uh, we also have studied the uh, XPS composition of all these different uh, electrolyte, um, this different artificial SEI, but uh, due to a uh, matter of time, I want to go into details. Indeed, what I want to mention also is uh, another topic that we've looked at, which is alloying anode. And indeed, interfaces we know to be very important also uh, on alloying anode, which um, to a certain extent uh, share common issues with lithium metal, like, for example, the large volumetric expansion, which is known to cause uh, um, pulverization uh, and uh, eventually uh, delamination of the electrode upon extended cycling. And in such a, a scenario, of course, it's uh, extremely important to establish an SEI layer, uh, which is capa capable of uh, withstanding uh, these volumetric changes without being uh, uh, substantially damaged and therefore growing um, upon cycling. Among all the possible alloying material, uh, which are been, which have been investigated and are uh, appealing. We found particularly interesting uh, aluminum. And uh, the reason being is that, uh, well, aluminum does not only provide twice the gravimetric capacity and volumetric capacity than graphite. Uh, of course, I mean, still lower than silicon or tin, but um, also this plays a much smaller volumetric change com compared to uh, lithium or, uh, or zinc or uh, silicon, uh, compared to tin or silicon, sorry. So additionally, uh, last but not least, I will say that al aluminum is, is the third most abundant element on the earth crust, uh, let's say after oxygen and silicon. And we already have uh, a relatively established aluminum production, uh, uh, I mean, aluminum manufacturing industry. So, I mean, uh, handling aluminum is already, uh, let's say, a mature technology. Although aluminum anode uh, 
have been somehow neglected in literature. And despite these uh, interesting properties, there were a very limited research interest in the past three decades. Here you can see the number of publications from 1990 to 2019. And there is only a handful of papers on aluminum, while there are really several hundreds on, um, on silicon. Most of these works only focused on, on materials, active material and electrode design with very fancy, uh, fancy uh, yolk shell structure or onto understand the engaging mechanism. So we were surprised that most of the work was done only with uh, organic electrolyte without, uh, I mean, carbonate based electrolyte without much focus on the role of, for example, different electrolyte and their uh, impact on the SEI. So what we decided to do is to <coughs> um, prepare some very, um, uh, let's say, easy uh, electrodes just based on a micro-sized uh, aluminum powder that you, that you can buy commercially and fabricated with a conventional tape casting metal and to test it with our portfolio of, uh, of electrolytes. And we found out that, interestingly, uh, in combination with uh, pyrrolidinium-based uh, ionic liquids um, based on a, a, a mixture of TFSI and FSI uh, and ions, so three fluorosulfonilimide and fluorosulfonilimide and ion, we could achieve substantially improved uh, cyclability and uh, Coulombic efficiency in a lithium aluminum half cell. And by looking at the composition of the, of the SEI, we could see that um, um, there is a substantial difference between um, uh, the two um, SEIs formed in ionic liquid electrolyte or in a carbonate-based electrolyte with the carbonate being mostly constituted by organic species and the ionic liquid-based uh, SEI instead uh, being rich in inorganic species resulting from the decomposition of the ionic liquid um, and ion like lithium fluoride or lithium sulfide. So we had to take a step back, and what we did it was to study the, the alloying mechanism, starting from the conventional uh, um, organic electrolyte. <coughs> and uh, we first did some inoperando XRD. And the first thing we noticed is that, of course, we have a first um, uh, lithiation step where no alloying is occurring. Uh, so only probably surface reaction, and afterwards, um, we have uh, we seem to have a, an uh, incomplete uh, lithiation and delithiation process, probably going through the formation of over lithiated phases at uh, the low potential window. Now we also again did XPS, uh, especially upon the first lithiation, and you can see here started at OCV and at different steps. And uh, as we could expect, um, the fresh uh, aluminum electrode is mostly uh, covered by a native oxide layer. Uh, while um, after the first, um, um, let's say, when we reach the, the potential plateau, we have the, the lithiation of this surface layer, forming a lithium aluminum oxide. <coughs> and the there is a formation of, uh, of the so-called beta phase uh, lithium uh, aluminum. Uh, at full lithiation, the postulated deritium-rich phase are indeed detected. And also, as previously observed by XRD, this um, uh, unre um, unreacted, not reacted aluminum can still de be detected here, confirming that the lithiation is not complete. And <clears throat> Interestingly, upon delithiation, so this is the XPS spectra of the delithiated uh, electrode, we can clearly see that we have lithium trapped on the surface in form of lithium alloy and lithium rich alloys. But the most interesting thing is that um, upon, um, uh, upon cycling, this lithium rich uh, phase seems to grow into the bulk of the active material. So we have a, a continuous trapping of lithium, uh, which is then um, 
uh, growing and growing inside the, the active material. And this is really an indicator or, of electrode failure, this growth and accumulation of lithium rich into the inner part of the electrode. In fact, we can clearly associate it with capacity fading, while in the case of the ionic liquid uh, electrolyte, we can see again as an indicator of electrode failure the uh, emergence of this uh, lithium rich alloys growing into the bulk but much later uh, in, in cycling so somehow telling us that this is phenomenon is delayed now why is this um, we still don't know whether this is only um, a mechanical effect or there are some chemical reason uh, due to, for example, different reactivities of these lithium rich alloys, we still don't know, and we are currently working on it. So, finally, I would like to just mention a paper that we have recently published, um, again on ionic liquid. And uh, ionic liquid, they're very well known for um, providing, let's say, an safety uh, due to the high thermal stability and negligible vapor pressure. And so far, we've seen we've used uh, fluorinated <coughs> um, ionic liquid. But recently, we have been also working on a class of uh, halide free ionic liquid based on uh, nitrile containing uh, anions, which are particularly interesting as they could, let's say, uh, enable uh, more environmentally friendly batteries as well as be uh, substantially cheaper. For example, DCA, the DCA based compounds are already produced on a large scale in the, for the pharmaceutical interest, uh, for the pharmaceutical industry. And additionally, these uh, fluorine-free ionic liquids, here you can see two examples, pyrrolidium-1 for DCA and TCM with the respective salt, have uh, substantially lower viscosity and higher conductivity than their uh, fluorinated counterpart, which is, of course, uh, beneficial. And although we have to pay the price in terms of, um, of anodic stability uh, due to the fluorine-free anion, which is only limited to four volts, which anyway, let's say, could be in principle suitable for low voltage cathode like sulfur or uh, of lithium uh, iron phosphate. And um, of course, we have looked at the compatibility with lithium metal, <coughs> and uh, DCA displays a relatively high interfacial resistance, but is quite stable upon cycling. And this suggests that the SEI is probably mostly formed upon contact with lithium already, uh, while the TCM base one uh, appears to be maybe thinner or more conductive uh, and gives a much smaller impedance. The XPS analysis um, evidences that the composition, the, the composition pathway for both anions may be similar and results in the, the same compounds, mostly being a polymeric nitrogen dope network lithium nitride and graphitic carbon. Uh, but uh, while the TCM, so the 3 cyanometanide based SEI is mostly rich in uh, lithium nitride, we see the DCA being uh, uh, substantially composed by graphitic carbon. And of course, this is a drawback as during, uh, due to its um, electronic conductivity, this may promote the growth of the SEI and for example, explain this higher interfacial resistance. Finally, um, we also probe the compatibility of these uh, class of ionic liquid with uh, silicon anodes. This work was done in collaboration with the University of Limerick in Ireland. Um, and we used the silicon nanowires uh, directly go on a stainless steel current collector. The advantage of this system is that these um, electrodes are um, binder and, uh, and carbon free. So they are somehow an ideal model electrode to, to study, for example, the SEI formed on, uh, in, in, um, in this ionic liquid, which is something we are currently doing. Uh, right now, I just want to show that with an optimized electrolyte composition, which also includes uh, an additional uh, SEI forming additive, uh, which we wanted also to keep uh, halide free. We selected VC. We can obtain uh, the typical um, um, electrochemical response of silicon anodes with uh, um, 
acceptable uh, cycling stability over around 250 cycles with uh, 80 percent um, capacity retention so uh, i would like to conclude now uh, acknowledging of course uh, our group uh, led by, by by stefano passerini who gives me always the freedom uh, and uh, encourage me uh, to to pursue uh, my my research, KIT and the Helmholtz Association for funding my position, all the funding uh, uh, all the funding agencies which have uh, uh, funded this work, our collaborators, and of course most mostly the guys who did the work, Katarina Tanna, who studied the artificial SEI on lithium with zinc chloride, Ving Shankin who performed the work on the aluminum alloy and new Shakarimi who is developing the uh, the fluorine free ionic liquid and of course all of you uh, for your attention yeah thank you very much Alberto for this uh, great insights into the different uh, topics you're working on especially the artificial SEI I think is a very important topic in the future and uh, there are a number of questions in the chat. I will try to, to read them from you. There are more questions coming. Thank you for posting uh, questions. So maybe we can start with a very basic question. Um, as you uh, introduced the, the zinc modification, for example, based on the papers uh, by Nazar, there are a couple of questions. Um, if you can explain how this mechanism works of the uh, SE, artificial SEI formation, and also how the zinc deposition modifies the conductivity of the surface. And I think a key question is also, I think you have indicated this also when you talked about the aluminum. What is the fate of the zinc in time? Uh, does it stay on the surface? Does it penetrate into the volume in the bulk? Um, how mobile is it? Does it redistribute into the uh, anode? Well, this is a very long and complicated question, but <laughs> what, I uh, what, I, yeah, what, yeah, what I can say, what I can say is that um, we have uh, well, the, 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 we did not uh, specifically study the mechanism. This was uh, um, shown by, uh, um, I mean, proposed by by the paper of Nazar, where you have uh, first the formation, uh, so the reduction of the of the zinc chloride to zinc metal, let's say, or indium, whatever it is, which is then. Uh, um, uh, let's say automatically uh, reduce uh, lithiated. What we've seen, though, uh, and I've not shown the data, but these are published. What we've seen is that um, if we uh, do sputtering of the surface, uh, we can still detect some uh, um, non-lithiated metallic zinc in the um, in the depth of the of the SEI of the artificial SEI even let's say closer to lithium than uh, than on the surface which um was um let's say uh, somehow a, a, a bit um surprising we've also observed um uh, the formation of uh, uh, zinc oxides and lithium zinc oxide so um, I think it's a bit of a simplification, saying that we just have lithium chloride and and um, and uh, lithium zinc. Uh, it's it's very difficult to 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 tune the composition of these uh, of these uh, SEI layers and let's say to understand um, how it evolves uh, upon cycling. Also, they are relatively thick, so. Mm, XPS gives you an idea of the ou outermost surface. You cannot sputter for uh, extremely long times, otherwise, uh, then the results become uh, unreliable. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. There are many more questions. One is also concerning the lithium chloride because it is an isolator. Um, so, the question comes from Rinaldo uh, Acicini. Um, maybe you know him, and yes. uh, um, and uh, he's asking basically how does the the isolating or insulating lithium chloride is affecting the electron conduction of the interface. Um, 
Well, the, the idea, I think the basic idea is to have uh, an interface, which is, uh, I mean, we did not measure the, the, um, uh, yeah, the electronic conductivity of the, um, of the samples, but the idea is, of course, uh, to block, um, to block the electrons from uh, reaching the, the, the SEI, the artificial SEI liquid electrolyte interface, which would uh, finally uh, promote the, the decomposition, uh, further decomposition of the, of the electrolyte and therefore the growth of the, uh, of the SEI, which is something that uh, to a certain extent we, f we, we fear we have in the case of these um, uh, halide-free uh, ionic liquids where the, the the anion is fully reduced to 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 carbon and lithium carbon, and this being uh, uh, highly conductive, for example, we we fear that this mm, is triggering the growth of the SEI and therefore explaining also the 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 larger interfacial resistance. <laughs> then there's also a, a question related to the aluminum uh, present part of your presentation. Yeah. Um, do you think aluminum can be efficiently used in anode-free cells in the future? Well, um, as we, uh, as an anode-free cell, as a, so far, what, uh, what we've seen and also from what is published, um, although the, the, um, the volumetric change, let's say, is is uh, is not massive. It seems that the strain uh, between the lithiated phases, especially the um, the over lithiated phases, and the non lithiated phases, is so large, uh, which uh, causes uh, massive uh, mechanical failure. So. <clears throat> If it is uh, possible to control the lithiation degree of the aluminum, um, this could be interesting for sure. Another thing that we have, um, um, we, we still do not know is whether these over lithiated phases are particularly reactive towards the electrolyte. So let's say, why does the lithium get trapped there? Is it just, um, breaking apart from the electrode and somehow becoming uh, electronically insulator, insulated, so dead lithium in a, a lithium aluminum uh, phase, or is it even the reactivity of this uh, over lithiated phase um, uh, promoting also the, the, um, the reduction of the, of the electrolyte? We don't know this yet. We are looking mm -hmm. at this. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I realize the lithium aluminum phase diagram is quite complex and many alloys are there with probably different reactivity and also mechanical properties. Um, maybe I can read one more question before we um, continue. Um, one question from Mina Gosch comes, uh, which is more on the basic side. Uh, what was the configuration of the lithium aluminum cell? So um, I think the question is also, if you can explain the configuration. It's, it's, the, 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 I mean, the electrochemical setup, there was a, a relatively easy uh, lithium half cell. And we've done uh, different tests, both in a two electrode and three electrode mode. Um, and the electrode, uh, we, we did not want to go for a foil, uh, which would have been a, a, an aluminum foil, which would have been, um, uh, probably the, the the easiest way, uh, but we did not want to, let's say, have the cyclability um, uh, issues somehow uh, completely overshadowing any effect of the electrolyte. So that we did not want to have a massive failure immediately, and therefore we decided just to um, buy a, a relatively standard uh, micro-sized aluminum powder and mix it with carbon and PVDF, I mean, with the normal casting procedure, so. Okay, 
see. Okay, great. Okay, I think in the interest of time, um, I would say that we would continue. Alberto, you can also access the attendee chat. So maybe you can just skip through the questions. I'm not sure if I, I, I read some of them and some of them are also related to each other. Um, maybe you can. Uh, yeah, try I will try to... my best to answer all of them in case I can't. Uh, uh, the attendees are welcome to drop me, uh, drop me an email at any time and I will be glad to answer. Thank you very much. That's great. Alberto, then thank you very much for this beautiful lecture. And uh, we come then now to our second presentation. So maybe Rosalba can already upload the presentation. So um, the next presentation comes from Celine Bashas. And um, she is a research scientist at CA Litten, one of the famous research institutes um, it, working in the area of lithium ion batteries. And she has been working in particular in the area of post-lithium-ion batteries for more than 10 years. And she has a lot of publications in the area of lithium metal batteries, in particular also lithium sulfur batteries and um, also all solid state technologies. She has authored many publications. And uh, what I uh, think is very interesting is also in particular are the studies on um, giving mechanistic insights, uh, in situ studies, in situ studies, on lithium uh, ion batteries are very valuable for the community because it is not only i think the um, development of technology that is important but also uh, the understanding of mechanisms is uh, a key for future development so i don't want to steal your time further celine and um, then we're looking forward to your presentation okay so good afternoon everyone and thank you Stephen for the kind introduction. Thank you also uh, for the organizer uh, to make this kind of um, a virtual event possible. So it's really a pleasure to talk this afternoon. And so today I will try to give you an overview of um, what we are doing on the topic of lithium metal anode for lithium sulfur on solid state batteries at CEA. So this work has been done with many co-workers uh, at CEA and other institutes, but in particular with a team from Bulleredex, uh, located in France, uh, in the frame of uh, Alim project. I will present later. So next slide. Uh, as Stefan mentioned, my background is really uh, the lithium sulfur chemistry. So I've spent some time trying to improve the system. And we finally, uh, we were able to develop uh, high performing cathodes uh, by tuning uh, the um, uh, sulfur electrode architecture. So I will not go too much into the details of this uh, this work, but uh, we, we were able to develop high capacity electrodes. So I mean, up to uh, uh, seven million hour per square centimeters with um, pretty stable capacity. But we, so if you go to the next slide, uh, we rapidly figure out that our, our the, one of the important limitations we face in lithium sulfur batteries is in fact not the sulfur electrode, but uh, the lithium metal uh, anode. In particular, when, when trying to cycle um, lithium metal with a liquid electrolyte. So on this graph, you have uh, um, the evolution of the capacity retention as a function of the uh, sulfur electrode capacity. And in fact, the uh, higher the capacity is, the sooner the cell, uh, the sudden death uh, is observed. So uh, we clearly evidence uh, problems of um, uh, dendrite. And uh, in fact, one simple experiment was, for example, to try to replace lithium in lithium sulfur cell uh, after sudden death. And we finally uh, make the cell able to cycle again. So uh, with small experiment, we were really uh, able to uh, point out this problem of uh, lithium, which is not really new, but uh, uh, so, uh, which was really important uh, for a system like lithium sulfur because we really target high sulfur, uh, high capacity electrodes, so uh, really exhaustive cycles uh, for lithium metal when stripping plating. 
And uh, if you click, uh, the, the main conclusion is really that we, um, with the specific lithium electrode thickness, we have kind of uh, optimum, uh, maximum, sorry, uh, cycle capacity. So if you have a low um, loading, low capacity electrode, you will be able to cycle longer, but at the end, you will exchange the same amount of coulomb uh, as when starting with a high sulfur, high loading, so high capacity electrode that will uh, fail sooner, but you will have exchanged uh, almost the same capacity. So if you go to the next slide, uh, I think this is um, um, uh, some uh, a fact that has been observed for uh, a long time. It's not really new that uh, um, lithium sulfur batteries are um, limited by uh, lithium electrolyte, lithium issue, I would say, because it, it's usually a, 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 there is a, a strong link between lithium issues and electrolytes. And uh, finally, with this system, we we need to have a trade-off between energy density and cyclability. And this uh, uh, this observation was shared. So, if you click by major uh, player in the field of uh, lithium sulfur batteries, for example, Cyan Power has reported a long time ago on uh, this trade-off between energy density and cyclability. You can have high energy uh, with few cycles, and you can get more cycles by um, decreasing the specific energy. And Oxys Energy has also devoted uh, some uh, effort in trying to protect lithium in order to get rid of this uh, MOS formation and to prolong cycling. So if you go to the next slide, with um, uh, a nice experiment we have implemented at ESRF, so really close to CEA uh, in Grenoble, together with the uh, co-workers of uh, LEPMI. Uh, through this uh, work, we were able to design a, a new cell, uh, really interesting cells because it really, it has really small dimension uh, to allow for um, high resolution X-ray absorption tomography, operando, but it's also um, fully representative from a real system. So it's airtight, we can control the pressure with a spring. So we could achieve operando absorption tomography uh, measurement with a resolution of about one micron per pixel and uh, a point uh, measurement every 30 minutes. So with this technique, and uh, uh, if you click, you will have a, a video. We were able to uh, image a full cell. So in our case, it was a lithium sulfur cell. But uh, we could really observe the behavior of the lithium metal electrode operando. So while avoiding to uh, dismantle the cell, for example, um, because when uh, doing uh, ex situ analysis, you, you can have some um, um, uh, damage of your lithium, elect lithium electrode. So thanks to this work, uh, we uh, rapidly figured out that uh, lithium uh, problems occurred quite rapidly. We have observed that the formation of holes into the lithium uh, foil. So in our case, we are um, uh, first uh, stripping lithium in a lithium sulfur cell. So we observed the rapid formation of holes or pits. And sometimes it's uh, called pits as soon as 10% uh, depth of discharge. And uh, so the, the, the lithium holes forms quite rapidly, and then the, the, these holes uh, grow rapidly in number and size. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that. Um, so we were able to uh, convert um, the thickness of these holes, lithium holes. Uh, in, in terms of current density, tr so trying to give an overview of the local current density on lithium, uh, the real one, not the one applied to the cell, as a function of depth of discharge. So here you can see the evolution through the first discharge. And in fact, you see that holes are, are formed uh, quite uh, rapidly. And then uh, the number of holes is growing. And uh, if we look, uh, if you click, you can have a, a review of the 
initial, initial lithium um, morphology, let's say. And uh, we, we believe that the behavior of, of lithium metal is clearly dependent from uh, the initial state of the lithium foil. So in our, our case, we were using a lithium foil, commercial one. Um, so I will come back to this uh, important uh, point later uh, about uh, initial state. And uh, one other important parameter was the uh, current density as well. So if uh, so you already know these two main failure mechanisms related to lithium metal, so we have this SEI formation, which is um, consuming lithium and uh, depositing a, an insulating product on top of the lithium electrode, and also the possible formation of dendrites. So in the literature, you, you can uh, have um, different approaches uh, that are proposed and uh, some were already presented by Alberto just before. Uh, you can coat your lithium either, either with a near organic coating or with a polymer. You can um, um, deposit artificial SEI. You can also use a solid state electrolyte. And you can also uh, tune your electrolyte by using specific additive to perform in situ SEI layer. And you can also uh, try to um, pre-treat your, your lithium electrode uh, before cell assembly. So this is what we uh, try to do, if you go to the next slide, by uh, texturing the lithium metal electrode. Uh, so either by using um, uh, tips uh, to, to pattern the, uh, the lithium foil before assembling the cell, uh, as uh, proposed before, uh, or by using 3D, so 3D current collector for the anode uh, composed of uh, carbon nanotubes that we were able to impregnate with lithium before cycling. But um, if you click, you can see that um, this strategy to all point of view is really uh, not sufficient alone. So for example, by needling the lithium foil, we have an increase of the capacity retention, but still uh, after 80 cycles, we are uh, already at 80% capacity uh, beginning of life. And in fact, we believe that uh, by patterning or uh, texturing the lithium electrode alone, uh, there is still a high surface contact with the liquid electrolyte, so severe uh, SEI formation and poor cyclability. So uh, in another work, we, uh, um, especially through a collaborative, French collaborative project, uh, we uh, evaluated the um, um, efficiency of uh, coating lithium by uh, inorganic thin films. So among the different uh, electrolytes, if you click, you can have an overview of the different uh, electrolytes that can be deposited on lithium. We selected uh, two type of materials, so one ceramic and one uh, thin film, which is usually uh, used in micro batteries. And today I will only focus on lipon. So if you click, uh, you will see that we uh, were able to deposit Lip on thin film on uh, lithium metal with a thickness of about one micron thick. Um, so it was really convenient because it's really low thickness and it's easily implemented afterwards in the uh, uh, coin cell. Uh, but um, the problem is that, um, so we have demonstrated if you click the ability of this protective layer to uh, passivate somehow the lithium metal electrode. But finally, um, in a real cell, so when we aim at cycling uh, uh, high millium hour, so high surface capacity, uh, so we are um, usually cycling many microns of lithium. And uh, we figured out that this one micron thick lipon is not mechanical, mechanically uh, stable enough to accommodate this volume change of lithium. So at the end, after a few cycles, we observe clearly the formation of severe SEI and uh, we have a limited cycle life uh, with these thin films. So 
uh, we two, two possibility uh, following this work was to investigate multi-layered system or to go to solid state system, which can have uh, usually have a higher thickness and uh, better mechanical properties. So this is what we uh, done. We have done with, through a collaboration uh, with Renault, so through a PhD uh, work. Uh, dedicated to the implementation of uh, LLZO um, solid state electrolyte in uh, lithium metal cells. And uh, today I will only focus on output of this work with lithium. And in fact, uh, we uh, th this work uh, really helped us to figure out the uh, strong relationship between uh, lithium interface with the pellet on cyclability. So despite the use of a dense pellet, so up to 97% density, uh, we could clearly observe, and uh, if you click, you have an uh, image uh, really clearly identifying the growth of dendrite in a solid electrolyte, uh, despite its, its density and despite its mechanical properties. So I think now it's really, um, it's more um, admitted into the literature and uh, we were not the only one to, to report this, but uh, so there is really a strong um, connection between uh, the quality of the lithium interface with solid electrolyte and the cycling uh, behavior. And we were able to improve uh, the cyclability, for example, by uh, improving the interface by hot pressing lithium with um, the pellet. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, yes, yeah, so at the end, uh, we, we can clearly see, and I think it's uh, more and more um, reported in the, in the literature that solid state alone is not um, uh, the perfect solution to avoid dendrites. So there is uh, still some work to do on um, uh, solid state to improve the, the quality of interfaces and to really, um, so I think this was one comment from uh, Alberto, that uh, solid state with lithium metal are, are still, have still some work to, to be done. So um, if you go to the next slide, and uh, as I mentioned before, the quality and the initial state of lithium metal is of importance. And this is what we wanted to address through this collaborative project. So ALIM, which stands for Advanced Lithium Metal Electrode, that was a kick funded uh, EIT raw material funded project that just finished uh, in the last December. And uh, in this uh, uh, collaborative project, the goal, if you go to the next, next slide, uh, you will see that the goal was um, to develop, to promote uh, um, commercialization of all solid state batteries, uh, in particular the uh, uh, lithium metal polymer cell, which is developed by Blue Solution, who was a partner on, of this project, by um, improving uh, the lithium metal electrode. One other uh, aspect of the project was also to go to uh, lithium sulfur um, cathode, but uh, this is not uh, really the, the topic today. So if you go to the next slide, you will have an overview of the uh, main target of the project. And the goal was to uh, produce lithium metal electrodes beyond state of the art. So there are many uh, lithium electrodes we can buy in, uh, to the suppliers. And I, I think there are uh, uh, good um, uh, improvement uh, of this uh, uh, commercial lithium electrode uh, with years. So uh, available thickness are um, more and more thin. But um, the goal was to go a step further and to develop uh, extra thin lithium metal electrodes in order to, uh, for, for sure, improve the energy density. So the less you put lithium, the less uh, the cell will, will weight. And also to save materials. 
not to be uh, uh, not to be forced to uh, use uh, too large excess of lithium. So uh, the project was uh, uh, together with Blue Solution as an expert of all solid state batteries, in particular as an expert of lithium electrode pro production. Buller Redex was um, uh, the partner in charge of developing the equipment uh, to be used for lithium metal rolling as an expert of uh, metal rolling in uh, many fields. CA was in charge of developing a pre-scale-up process and validating the quality of the lithium produced in the project. And uh, Uppsala University was also in charge of qualifying the um, quality of the lithium electrode uh, after production. So the project was divided in two parts. Uh, the first part was to define the main parameters uh, to design the pilot equipment. So at first we had, uh, um, if you go to, if you click, we had first to um, select the best materials for lithium rolling to um, uh, allow for low adhesion with lithium. With these materials, we were able to uh, test rolls. Uh, on the hand uh, rolling mills to select the best roll, rolls to be implemented on a pilot equipment installed, installed sorry, by Redex at CEA. So in the uh, in CEA dry room. And we were able on this equipment to uh, operate and develop a lithium metal rolling process that I will present afterward. So if you go to the next slide, you will have a picture of the equipment. So it's um, what we call a lab scale rolling mill, so small scale uh, rolling mill installed in CA dry room. Uh, that is really convenient because with this equipment, we were able to roll either in guts, so in guts of lithium or whatever. We were also able to uh, roll st in standard modes so I mean, as usually done for lithium with a lubricant, so to roll a film. And we were also able to develop um, a new uh, dry so lubricant-free process of lithium films. If you go to the next slide. So with this project, we run with this uh, equipment, sorry, we were able to pr uh, uh, produce films of lithium down to 10 microns. So between 60 and uh, 10 microns, depending on the uh, equipment param parameters, but uh, thickness down to 15 microns were uh, really easy, uh, easy uh, obtain. We this equipment is uh, really uh, versatile and allow to operate in different modes. So we can roll lithium, but also alloys, foils, and ingots. And uh, we were able to laminate, to roll, sorry, uh, lithium foil uh, with the width of up to uh, 100 millimeter at a speed up to 30 meters per minute. So if you want to have more information, uh, there is uh, still the Alim, Alim website open, if you want to have a look. And uh, with this slide, I would like to Yes, if you go to the next slide, <laughs> you will have the, the, this slide where I would like to thank all co-workers for um, uh, all the work presented here. So in particular at CEA, also co-workers from uh, Grenoble, so from LEPMI and from ESRF, co-workers from the ALIM uh, project, in particular Uppsala, Blue Solution, and uh, in particular Blue Loredex, with whom we had a really strong collaboration and also all um, partners for funding, and also you for your attention. So thanks a lot, and if you have any yeah. questions. Thank you, Celine, for this great and very impressive uh, presentation. Um, and uh, this is really a highlight, I have to say, this 10 micron processing for such a sticky metal. I think this is really very impressive work. and. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the to the discussion here. So there are a number of questions in the chat um, already. Maybe I can start with uh, one question related to the solid state um, electrolyte that you have uh, discussed. So um, there is a question about the surface from Ulderico um, 
Oh, sorry, Ulissi, uh, have you looked at the effect of the LLZO surface chemistry on uh, CCD? So um, there are a couple of questions related to this aspect. Um, um, there's also a question if you did any pretreatments for the LLZO. Okay, so I didn't go too much into the detail of this work, but uh, I agree that there is a strong, and I think this was really the message I wanted to, to give, that there is a, str a strong correlation between uh, electrolyte in surface or um, chemistry uh, and uh, lithium behavior and lit uh, interface quality as well. So. Um, there are many parameters that we can um, uh, investigate, and we have already investigated some, so today I can't uh, really uh, go too much into the details, but uh, yes, for sure it's crucial. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, and then also related to this aspect, um, recently there's a lot of discussion on the impact of pressure on these cells, so um, there's a question from Selva Mani Vadivel, what might be the pressure applied to the cell and how to ensure the interfacial contact? Mm. I think it's a good question. And I, I think there is not only one response uh, for each system. I think you need to adapt each system. I mean, one cathode and one electrolyte. So it depends. Uh, it depends. Um, so for the lithium sulfur cell, uh, this is the reason, this was one of our motivation uh, to develop this cell with pressure control uh, to be able to look at the behavior of lithium operando by applying uh, increasing pressure. So unfortunately, we were not able to um, go to this uh, at this level with the PhD, uh, we had because, uh, because it was, uh, he has already done a, a significant job. But I think now we have this cell ready and we could even cycle lithium, lithium cell uh, with whatever uh, inside and we increase the pressure and have a direct um, feedback uh, with the tomography uh, depending on the pressure. Mm -hmm. Then there was one question to the very early part of your presentation from Tushan Patirana um, about the N to P ratio for the cells that started to fail after 40 to 50 cycles. Unfortunately, I don't have a slide number here, but um, I think this was in the very beginning of your presentation that you had the cells that started to fail after 40 to 50 cycles. And the question is the N to P ratio. Uh, so I, I, I would need to look back into the data to have a um, really precise uh, answer, but I would say that we were in excess of lithium. I think it was the slide even before. Uh, we, we had an excess of lithium, maybe uh, 20 times, 20 times excess for low sulfur loading, and maybe only five or six uh, per, uh, times excess for um, high capacity um, sulfur electrode. But mm -hmm. uh, at least, uh, yes, for sure, we had an excess uh, of electrolyte and lithium uh, at the beginning. Uh, then uh, there are many questions on the 10 micron thin foil. Um, maybe we can start a little bit with the mechanical properties. So there are questions about how to handle these thin foil uh, foils. Do you laminate them onto a copper current collector directly or can you handle them um, freely? Maybe you can, you can have You can have them self-standing. I think you can um, handle them as when buying some uh, thin commercial lithium foil. For sure, it's fragile, but we, can, we were able to produce uh, cells and it. no, it's not. So we can... It's, it's really the... the the touchy part is uh, when producing them because you need some mechanical um, uh, forces on the foil, but afterwards it's, it's okay. Touchy part is a good keyword, so we can touch them or handle them with our hands or? Yes. Yeah, okay, so they're quite robust. I mean, it's a very um, soft metal, of course, okay. And um, then there are a, a few questions on 
uh, I think this is a question that often comes up, how these foils differ maybe in electrochemical performance. Do they have a different surface morphology or, um, yeah, these are um, questions coming up. So the surface morphology depends on the rolling process. I mentioned that we were using uh, two different type of uh, process. So the morphology is dependent on the process. And um, we also checked. So at CEA and at Blue Solution, the quality, let's say, of um, the lithium foil produced within a limb. And uh, in fact, we were quite happy to see that uh, at, a, at a constant thickness. So it's difficult to compare um, uh, lithium, extra thin lithium foil because there is not really no real, no real uh, references. But uh, at higher thickness, uh, the quality was uh, similar and electrochemical tests were uh, similar. And the roughness is also similar to normal? Uh, no, it's it's changing with the process, but mm -hmm. uh, usually rolling, rolling improves uh, the lithium quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then a question also related to the processing, Adrian Fries is asking, what to use as lubricant? Um, mm -hmm. So I was also not so clear. I, I understood that you are not using a lubricant in one of the processes, but I, maybe I'm... Exactly. Confused. Exactly. So we were able to operate the equipment with two modes. So one with lubricant, uh, which I would say is the easiest uh, way to operate the rolling mill. And I would not be able to give real details of the lubricant composition, but uh, and there is we were we're also able to operate with the dry process, so without any lubricants, and it gives really high quality lithium. And then the key technology is what type of role you use then. Exactly. And, and this exactly. is probably also expected that you will not disclose this information. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. This is really, um, uh, this work was really um, um, thanks to the strong collaboration we have with Buller Edex, which is really the expert of uh, metal rolling in general. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay, maybe a last question from Francesco Pagani. Do you think the prepared li thin lithium uh, should be directly surface treated after the processing? I think it's if it's for um, ex situ patterning or ex situ uh, SEI uh, formation, I think we have no choice. But maybe I didn't understand the question properly. I, I think the question is: uh, Should we store the lithium foil after the processing, or should we hmm. uh, directly surface treat it to, yeah? enhance the performance i mean uh, in I, I think you are working in the dry room so the dry room also has always some residual carbonate formation that might be possible or hydroxide formation that might be possible so i think the question is what is the future direction should we sort of protect it um, directly after the processing or should we just pack it rapidly or mm. i think it's a good question so and it will also be <coughs> dependent on the electrolyte. I think there are some electrolytes really uh, less sensitive to um, lithium uh, aging, if I can call it like that. Um, but this is something definitely to be investigated for each technology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in our case, we, we saw some, some effects. Yeah. Great. Okay. Then in the interest of time, I think uh, we had a lot of interesting questions. Thank you very much for participating in the discussion. And uh, thank you, Celine, for this great and very encouraging presentation. Very interesting insights from fundamental to applied uh, research, I would say. And um, I think in the interest of time, we have to come to our last presenter. So um, maybe, Holger, you can already share your slides so that we don't lose time. Thank you again, Celine, for the great okay, presentation. Okay, you're welcome. Thank yeah. you, Stefan. And please, maybe you can look into the chat and uh, may maybe there were a few questions sure. that I sort of didn't
did not fully address and you can uh, chat a little bit in uh, in there. Okay, great. Sure. Wonderful. Then we come to Dr. Holger Altus. So uh, Dr. Holger Altus uh, studied chemistry and chemical engineering and um, then uh, received his PhD from Technical University Dresden. Uh, he worked with me also for some time, still working with me now at the Fraunhofer Institute for Material and Beam Technology since 2008. So first he was their team manager and uh, now uh, he uh, has three subgroups. So uh, he has grown the team substantially with many scientists in the field. And um, he is a, now a division manager and he administrates various European projects, but also direct uh, industry funded projects at the Fraunhofer Institute. Fraunhofer is an applied uh, research organization and he's mainly focusing on uh, thin film deposition techniques, electrode processing, uh, of course, for energy storage applications, also mainly focusing or uh, very much focusing on the lithium sulfur battery, but also with recent focus on material and electrode development for solid state battery. And of course, manufacturing also not only coin cells, but also up to the uh, pouch cell level. He has also worked in the field of supercapacitors and also other coating technologies for for many years and has a broad um, overview and, and, and a broad background there. And today he will give us some insights into the latest uh, development in particular in the processing of lithium thin films. I think this is a direct continuation of what we have seen from Celine with some alternative technologies. And um, so the presentation is entitled Processing Thin Films as Tailored Anodes for Future Generation Batteries. And I hope that the, yeah we can see the slides already. Holger, the floor is yours then. Yes, thank you, Stefan. Can you confirm that you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks. So thanks for the introduction. Um, so I would like to highlight some issues of uh, processing thin lithium films and some solutions from our uh, work. Um, um, and um, yeah, I would like to start with mentioning the demand for lithium thin films and the thickness requirements. So the question, what uh, is actually the thickness we need for the various cell chemistries? And then introduce a new um, multi-position technology for thin film processing. So that is an alternative to, to what we have seen. Um, and uh, yeah, introduce a concept, um, show some uh, characterization, structural and electrochemical film characterization on these films and some first demonstration in also solid state batteries. Uh, I would like to mention also uh, technology for cutting lithium anodes and uh, draw some conclusions in the end. Um, yes, so for the state of the art is the lithium ion technology and we have established methods for making anodes and cathodes. Um, uh, uh, with uh, major steps of coating, uh, double side uh, to current collectors, uh, cutting, uh, stacking, welding, and um, uh, electrolyte filling when you make a, a multi layer pouch cells, for example. And uh, uh, of course, the motivation is um, when you think of lithium metal anodes to increase energy density by uh, substitution of um, the graphite anode today. Um, and this is explained on the next slide. So there's a big impact on the energy density, as you know, um, by going from graphite to lithium metal. And if you uh, consider a, a graphite anode of about 100 or 80 micrometer uh, thickness, um, then this can be um, replaced by a lithium metal anode in the range of 20 to 25 micrometer thickness just because of the high specific energy and the specific capacity of the lithium anode and uh, the volumetric um, capacity. On cell level, this may lead to uh, increase in volumetric energy density of about increase of about 65% uh, maximum. Um, and this is a big motivation, of course, to uh, get to enhanced um, batteries in future. Um, then the question is, uh, what will be the th film thickness you actually require for the different cell chemistries. And here you have to differentiate the different cases. Um, first, if you combine the lithium metal anode with NMC type cathodes, you only need a very thin uh, lithium layer because the lithium is stored in, in the cathode. And we have seen the different concepts of using solid state batteries um, where the electrolyte is uh, made of a solid, uh, either polymer or other type of materials. Then there's a classic uh, liquid electrolyte um, 
system with a, a pore separator and there are hybrid types which have been already mentioned by the previous presentations where the solid electrolyte forms a yeah, protective layer on the lithium metal anode so they are all uh, similar uh, and of course uh, people look for the perfect solid electrolyte and uh, interface to the anode in order to increase um, efficiency and uh, usability of the anode um, we have to differentiate to to another cell chemistry like the lithium sulfur uh, chemistry which are typically made by a carbon sulfur composite on the cathode side uh, it works with liquid electrolytes typically and um, it, it also in, uh, uses uh, lithium metal anodes here um, often the cells are manufactured in the charged state that means the lithium you need for cycling is already part of the anode and sometimes even the current collector on the anode side is made of lithium that means here you need a quite uh, big excess um, in, in lithium and this uh, gives another requirement for film thickness of course and uh, for the lithium ion case so um, yeah in order to answer the question how much uh, lithium do I need um, you need to consider um, do I need the lithium for current collection or do I add a copper or nickel based uh, current collector in addition um, this would be need a um, substantial amount of silicium um, and when you use it as a current collector then how much i need for reversible cycling this um, this relates to the yeah cathode thickness and uh, aerial capacity you uh, use so this is directly correlated with the cell design and then of course you um, you want some lithium for compensating losses uh, for, by forming SEI, by forming dead lithium, um, then you want to comp compensate this, this will be an additional lithium you need. Um, and in order to estimate this, um, I think you need to, to do tests and uh, maybe some calculations. And the, I did a very simple calculation here on the right. If you have a cell with four milliamp hours per square centimeter capacity and you lose about 1% of lithium in every cycle, uh, then you you um, need a substantial amount of lithium in terms of um, yeah up to 25 micrometer thickness in order to compensate these losses after uh, 500 cycles and of course um, if you have a higher coulombic efficiency or uh, lower losses of lithium then you can um, um, yeah get to too much lower requirements for the lithium uh, thickness. Of course, 25 micrometer just for the losses would um, substantially reduce the energy density you can get from this system. So um, in the end, uh, my conclusion here is that yeah, film thickness highly depend on many parameters and um, we estimate just for advanced NMC lithium metal batteries that typically one to 10 micrometer thick films are required in order to compensate the losses and just um, yeah, be, be part of the anode during cell construction. Um, for at least some sulfur batteries, it depends on if you use it as current collector or not. But in case you have a, a copper or nickel current collector, we still assume that you need about 20 uh, to 40 micrometer lithium films on both sides of the current collector for uh, typical um, yeah, lithium sulfur cells. In this range of um, thickness, um, there are limited uh, technologies. This is one of the challenges. I here I would like to, to mention the challenges related to the lithium metal. And we heard about dendritic and porous growth. We heard about decomposition and depletion of electrolytes. I think these are the real uh, problems of the lithium metal and uh, new electrolytes and new uh, concepts need to be developed for this. But there are also challenges related just to the processing. And um, here it's uh, difficult to make uh, thin uh, films um, below 50 micrometer um, and there are other issues in handling cutting stacking so you cannot simply use the existing tools and the existing processes and new concepts need to be developed and this is what i would like to mention in the following so this slide i, I thought about to remove or to correct because uh, celine just uh, uh, showed the, the advancement and the and progress in uh, making lithium uh, foils by extrusion and rolling. Um, this is taken by um, by a presentation from Redex uh, Group Company, showing that uh, starting with ingots, uh, you um, you can extrude lithium strips and roll it down to thin foils. I know that this is a very suitable method for making thin um, foils, but I wasn't aware that this is possible already to make like 10 micrometer foils. So I think this is really a, seems really to be a competing technology. So far, um, there's not so much commercial samples um, in this range available, limited in width, limited in thickness. But um, yeah, of course, we can expect some progress in, in this uh, area as well. 
the other way to make lithium films is um, doing it uh, yeah bottom up basically um, to deposit from a vacuum um, coating uh, concept um, where you can make very precise thin films um, deposited on various substrate uh, this has been demonstrated successfully it can be made wall to wall there are examples in literature and um, some companies doing these type of coatings um, I think there are some lim limitations related to the physical vapor deposition technologies. Um, there's a limitation in deposition rate. And with this, uh, there is a relation of the process cost with the film thickness. So um, I think the strength of this technology is basically in um, if you um, if you make uh, only a few micrometer thick films, but it's, it gets costly if you um, uh, need some uh, tens micrometer films. So that means uh, there are different technologies available already, um, having different strengths. Um, one in the area of uh, larger thick films, uh, the other in the range of um, very thin films, and um, this is where we uh, try to to yeah close the gap mainly um, in in this range of a few micrometer films by um, developing a new concept um, based on um, melt deposition. So our idea is to use a copper foil as a current collector, for example. Uh, it also works with nickel foil, um, and to deposit uh, lithium um, from both sides of the current collector by a melt deposition. Uh, here, um, if you if you started this work, we we found that uh, the typical current collectors we we use uh, have a problem with this process. It actually doesn't work because um, the surface of copper and also nickel. Uh, tends to be highly lithophobic. That means if you melt lithium, it forms a sphere on the top of the um, current collector. So a very um, high um, contact angle between the uh, lithium and the and the substrate, and this makes it very difficult to to get a homogeneous coating uh, out of it, uh, depending on um, how you deposit the coating. Um, so we. Um, we're looking for ways how to um, make a lithophilic surface on the surface um, of the copper current collector in order to get a better spreading and um, wetting of the melt in order to um, to yeah, use actual wet processing, uh, processing concepts. Um, we found that um, copper one oxide um, is an effective uh, lithophilic layer and it can be easily um, made on the copper foil. Um, and uh, in the thickness range of a um, few nanometers to a few hundred nanometers, we see an effective lithophilization of the surface. Um, and depending on the thickness, you, you get a quite fast and quick uh, spreading of the lithium melt um, in this, um, uh, in this uh, concept. This uh, basic idea could be transferred to yeah, actual water wall coating. Uh, we can uh, modify the copper surface easily by a furnace at uh, under air atmosphere um, in our lab. Um, we can make it roll to bowl and get a homogeneous um, oxidation of the surface um, and can use this foil then for further deposition of lithium. Um, and the lithium deposition is, uh, of course, done under argon. Uh, we deal with um, molten lithium here. Um, and we get um, uh, a homogeneous film by this dipping type process. Uh, and you see it runs uh, with reasonable speed and um, gives a, um, a relatively good coating quality. We cut, then cut um, yeah, electrodes, which we can use for pouch cell investigations as example. So we could transfer this basic idea into um, yeah, first equipment and first demonstration. Um, and we found also some impact on film thickness for doing it. Um, and uh, we compared this to calculations we made, very simple calculations being done based on laws being, uh, being created for the dip coating process. Of course, dip coating of molten lithium is a bit complicated. There are uh, effects of solidification when uh, once uh, the, the film is cooled down. So there's a, a high impact of different parameters, but still uh, we found that, um, that uh, our um, experiments in red uh, follow to a certain extent uh, the, the laws and the uh, dependencies which we expected from the um, dip coating um, yeah, uh, laws. Um, that means with the coating ve velocity, we can um, adapt the film thickness in the range here between five and about 
50 micrometer. So there's a clear dependence on the um, coating velocity. Um, there's only a very minor dependency on lithium temperature in the range we observed here between 200 and 230 degrees. There's almost no um, no big impact on um, on the film thickness from from the temperature. That is actually good news because then it's better to control um, the film thickness and with the content coating angle you have maybe have seen during the coating process we can modify the angle and with this we can also um yeah um have an impact on the lithium thickness also in the range of yeah up to 20 micrometer um, down to seven micrometer in this specific experiment of course we cannot combine uh, coating velocity and coating angle and we can um, get to quite a wide range of uh, film thicknesses in the range between two and 20 micrometer um, we can uh, adapt the, the film thickness. Um, yeah, here are some SEM invest investigations. We get a, a direct um, uh, homogeneous uh, coating on the very thin copper foils. We can make this on a six micrometer copper as an example. Um, and uh, we get some surface passivation when we uh, take this um, freshly prepared lithium uh, to air or, or dry air atmosphere. Of course, we get surface oxidation. Um, but di directly after the process under argon, we have a very fresh surface. Here's also another investigation by um, focused ion beam uh, SEM. Um, and you see that uh, here we have a rather thick uh, passivation layer, which is grown just by uh, having air contact uh, during sample transfer. But um, you also see that we have a good homogeneous um, a contact between lithium and the substrate. Yeah, we looked at the surface characteristics and surface uh, roughness um, and compared this to a rolled um, commercial available freestanding um, lithium foil. And we see a different kind of surface roughness and surface morphology. Uh, the coatings made by a melt deposition have a granular structure and uh, looks like crystallites forming um, during the solidification process. Um, but when we compare um, the roughness values, we are actually in a similar range as the rolled um, uh, foil with the trenches on the surface. Um, so we get uh, similar values, but still a much different um, yeah, morphology of the films. We looked at electrochemical um, utilization of these films. Um, this is just one example with a rather thick film from our uh, deposition. Um, so we ended up with um, over 20 micrometer uh, thickness. Um, and this translated in this stripping experiment where we put the lithium versus a current collector with liquid electrolyte and just do did one stripping experiment. And we can measure about 5.5 uh, milliamp hours per square centimeter for this film um, and find, find typically a good correlation between um, yeah, lithium mass and coating thickness and the aerial capacity we can derive from the electrochemical experiment. This is shown here. Uh, and again, the relation to the coating velocity where we can control the film thickness with. Yeah, we um, use these films also in a solid state setup just to demonstrate its uh, feasibility and um, uh, usability. Um, we did symmetric cells here with a solid electrolyte being agarotide, uh, sulfide-based uh, solid electrolyte. We found that um, there's a very low difference uh, in terms of the impedance between both um, the reference uh, lithium foil and our lithium film. So we were afraid that the interface layer we use, the copper oxide, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, may lead to additional interface resistance in these uh, cells. But actually, we could exclude this and only found a very minor de uh, def deviation between both uh, lithium uh, anodes. Uh, and also cycling at 0.14 milliamps for 30 minutes uh, charge and 30 minutes discharge for 100 cycles um, showed a very similar uh, over potential and over, overall the performance is very comparable between the uh, 11 micrometer lithium deposited by the melt process uh, compared to the lithium chip we used here as a reference. Uh, we did also a full cell investigation with solid state. So um, a five micrometer lithium thin film has been 
used uh, together with solid electrolyte, uh, again, the agarodite type electrolyte and the composite cathode made of NMC with um, the solid electrolyte mixture. Um, we can fully utilize this type of NMC in these cells uh, and also um, recharge the cell um, and get um, uh, pretty stable cycling. Uh, over 350 cycles for these cells um, and still have 81 percent of the initial capacity however this is only a yeah, demonstration experiment under lab uh, conditions i would say we use here a quite low aerial capacity of only one milliamp hours per square centimeter so this is not a high energy optimized cell it's just a demonstration that this can be operated in a rather stable way so um, after the coating, uh, I would like to mention another process which seems to be challenging for handling at least a metal, um, which is a laser cutting. Uh, State-of-the-art technologies typically are not perfectly suitable for cutting lithium anodes. Um, you can do mechanical cutting, but you end up with an undefined edge. And um, as you see in the SEM images here, and due to the stickiness and the softness of the lithium, um, it's quite difficult. And the stickiness also, stickiness also means that your tool uh, needs to be cleaned or um, uh, modified after some um, some cutting steps. So it's quite um, quite difficult to use a mechanical cutting, and it's not um, perfect for for production yet. Um, and we used, used our laser cutting system. We have an established laser cutting system which we use for yeah shaping and cutting electrodes of various kinds and we use that for lithium and it worked fine we can do it under dry atmosphere and and so we can do these experiments but uh, we found that um, in every case such bulge is forming um, at the edge and we saw that also from literature that other groups found uh, similar behavior once you use the laser uh, you have some heat impact on the cutting edge and um, the lithium is melting and forming this type of bulge, which is much thicker than the original foil. And this causes, of course, problems when you try to build a multi-layer cell with, with this type of lithium. So we have a running project where we, uh, where we um, look at solutions for, for this laser uh, cutting process in order to um, replace the um, often used mechanical cutting process. And we found a way to run the uh, laser process um, in order to get a, a bulge-free um, cutting edge, which is seen here in the SEM. And we were able to um, implement this into a fully automated laser cutting process. So this is really lithium coming from the coil and is cutting to a certain dimension and then stacked into a magazine. Um, so this can uh, run fully automated um, in order to um, to prepare a magazine for automated stacking uh, um, subsequently after this cutting process. So um, there's a, we found a way to do it. Uh, this is still um, under patenting um, issues, so I cannot give any details, but uh, I can show that it works. Um, and this is also my conclusion. Um, we found ways to, to make lithium films range of 2 to 20 micrometer. Um, uh, thickness uh, by a melt deposition process which runs effectively and uh, gives very fresh lithium surface um, and uh, we, we found also a way to to get uh, um, a reasonable uh, good edge quality during um, yeah laser cutting of the lithium uh, anodes um, in in our fully automated laser cutting machine this means um, that processes for production are challenging. We need some new ways to, to make lithium anodes and cannot directly translate um, existing uh, large-scale manufacturing technologies from lithium ion. But I think um, this will be not a major hurdle. So I think there are solutions. Um, I just showed here two examples from our lab, and I'm convinced that, and we also see from Celine a way now to, to make uh, 10 micrometer films by rolling. So there are solutions uh, and this is in the end only engineering to make it. Uh, and um, of course it's, it's challenging work, but it's it's not a showstopper, I would say. But of course the re-challenge is still to uh, enable stable cycling, uh, to, to have a stable interface to the electrolyte, to get efficient stripping plating um, processes. And maybe there's a combination of making, uh, using new processes like uh, the the, the melt deposition using the highly fresh uh, surface in order to combine with a 
artificial SEI. I think that that was the idea I, I had when when I listened to the talk of Alberto. He said that he needs very fresh surface in order to get a good uh, coating of uh, his zinc chloride modification, for example. I think uh, com combining these new um, methods with um, solutions for artificial SEI and, and uh, mod surface modifications can be a, a suitable way for the future um, work. With this, I would like to, to mention um, um, our project partners and um, funding agencies. Um, I would like to highlight uh, one of our projects, which is the BMBF funded uh, Excel Batmat cluster. This um, not only funds uh, uh, um, the battery center in Dresden, but it, com it funds uh, collaboration between four centers uh, with um, colleagues from Alberto in Ulm, uh, with uh, colleagues in Münster and Munich, um, and it's a great um, cluster for um, yeah, uh, joining the forces in uh, German battery science and technology. Um, and finally, I would like to mention our um, um, the, the planning of the International Conference on Lithium Sulfur Batteries. This will be held uh, in June uh, 28th to 30th. Um, we, we originally planned this to have it in um, in, in Dresden. Um, most likely, uh, there will be options to um, to join virtually, um, um, and uh, you will receive further information on our website. Um, and uh, hope to to see you again if you are interested in the lithium sulfur technology. With this, I would like to conclude and um, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Holger, for this uh, great overview on this new technology, which is sort of a competing technology to the one Celine introduced, <laughs> and, uh, but maybe also complementary. Who knows? And um, yeah, there are a lot of questions in the uh, chat at the moment. Yeah, thank you also for turning your camera on. Um, um, so one question um, concerns the process of the uh, conversion. Basically, the copper oxides converts into uh, lithium oxide. So um, the, the question is how much um, copper oxide is needed and uh, are you really only forming uh, lithium metal or are you forming a lot of copper metal um, inside the lithium? Um, these are questions coming yes. up. Yes, okay, that's an obvious question, and thank you for, for this uh, good question. Um, this is something which we consider. Um, we, um, of course, we want the, the lithophilic layer to be as thin as possible because um, we, we didn't plan to have any side, uh, we didn't want to have any side reactions. And of course, the, the mechanism actually requires um, a reaction of the lithium metal with the copper oxide. So we actually see copper particles in in our lithium films, so um, of course uh, the uh, the copper oxide will react with the lithium, uh, forming lithium oxide and um, and elemental uh, copper uh, particles, um, and we want to to be this as uh, thin as possible in order to avoid any um, yeah interface resistance or any other problems related to the copper particles. And as seen here, I, I hope you see the slide um, that uh, with a 50 micrometer. Uh, 50 nanometer copper oxide, so rather thin film, we still get a um, um, full spreading of the lithium melt, um, but we get a faster uh, um, wetting when we have uh, larger film thicknesses. And of course, with the film thickness, um, we, we will uh, have an impact on the amount of copper forming uh, in the end. So this is still under investigation, it's still under optimization, and we also look for different uh, ways of lithophilic layers which may, might be not consumed by a reaction with lithium but uh, be reversible be used um, and we have some some concepts to be followed but uh, today it's we use the copper oxide and uh, live with the uh, side reactions we have here very good um, then there's one question from uh, selva mani vadivel about the freestanding solid electrolyte thin film so the question is how did you prepare this thin film um, actually, we, we didn't use a, um, a freestanding film in this case. So this is maybe a bit misleading from the uh, image. Uh, this is actually a powder pellet, more or less, uh, in, this, in this case. Um, we are working on processes, how to make films from, from the solid electrolyte. Um, uh, but um, this is not being used here. It's just, that was just a, a simple um, setup for testing the lithium films.
Mm -hmm. uh, then there's one question on the laser cutting for the lithium bulge formation. Um, do you also observe this bulge formation at low laser power density? Yes. Um, so <laughs> uh, this is uh, the, the colleagues really looked for a long time for different power meters and uh, varied the po uh, power inputs and, and so on and found finally a way how to circumvent it. I cannot go into details concerning the solutions, but yes, we, we tested different um, um, yeah, energy input in, in the um, cutting edge and uh, we always found this, this bulge before we found uh, really the innovation how to solve it. <laughs> Um, then there's one question from Stefan Koch. Um, have you tried other substrates than copper foils? Uh, comment yes. on the role of the surface morphology of the substrate. Yes. Um, yes, we, we are working with different kinds. So um, what we did with copper can be uh, quite uh, directly be transferred to uh, nickel foil. So we work with the uh, nickel foil as well. Uh, it behaves a bit different, but the concept works in, in principle also on nickel. And we look at uh, 3D substrates and um, carbon fibers and so on, where we need different modification. Here we oxidize the, the copper. Um, and of course, we need some additional lithophilic layer once we use a different kind of material like um, carbon fibers. Uh, but there's literature on lithophilic treatments of, um, of carbon, for example, by zinc precursors, uh, and this works also for our process. We um, we did something like this, and um, and also showed that we can use uh, yeah carbon fiber materials and and something like this. Yeah, and then maybe a question related to this: um, How important is the lithium surface roughness on the electrochemistry? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually. Um, I I cannot answer this perfectly. Um, it, it certainly depends on the electrolyte chemistry you, you use, I guess. Um, typically, uh, after first cycle, you anyway change the surface and the interface um, completely. So I would assume that it's not so important. Of course, you don't want maybe big particles on, on the surface or something, but uh, I would assume that, that roughness is not as critical. But um, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Okay. <laughs> and then maybe as a last question, um, this is always the important question of the cost. Um, so how is, would the, be the cost comparison of the ultra thin lithium foil uh, compared to other foils that are around 50 to 100 micron thick? Um, in terms of processing costs or? Uh, I think uh, probably, uh, I think here um, this question comes from Tushan Patirana. I think this is a direct comparison. How expensive would be your product compared <laughs> to <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay. Is a good question, but maybe you can give some insights or projected numbers. Um. Yeah, actually, we, we don't have numbers for, uh, for, for um, the Costs. I think that has to really to be calculated once you have really one um, product for a specific uh, application. Uh, as I said, we work with a wide range of thicknesses and so on. So um, I cannot give you a number for the cost. Um, I think it the, the multi position um, can be really competitive. Uh, you don't need vacuum. You have a, a quite fast process, um, and especially in the thickness range uh, of The one to 20 micrometer, I think it has its advantages. But yeah, uh, we see also com competing technologies appearing and we will see who wins. <laughs> Actually, I was um, so uh, uh, Tushan just corrected uh, himself. Okay. So it was about the processing costs. So, okay. Um, yes, so we, we don't have the full picture yet. So we need to work under argon. Uh, we don't need vacuum. Uh, we, we have quite a high uh, velocity for, for coating. Um, but we most likely don't have the final setup of this process. So we are still developing the equipment and, and everything. So there's not a realistic estimation on, on costs here. Um, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no problem. I think that's uh, for young technology, it's always difficult to project the, the real cost. Okay. Yeah. Then I think we are at the end of our meeting today. Holger, thank you very much for these great insights into this applied technology. So maybe you just unshare your presentation exactly. 
And uh, maybe I can ask all the contributors to turn on the camera again towards the end to have sort of a final closing remarks. I know I will hand over to Rosalba in a minute, but uh, I would like to thank you very much. Maybe we can have a sort of closing remark also in terms of contents. Today we have discussed the lithium metal anode. So maybe I can ask uh, a, a, a general question to all the three presenters. What do you think is the timeline for the implementation of the lithium metal anode uh, in real applications? And um, what do you think are the first markets that uh, will emerge? And uh, maybe we can start with the last presenter. Only a short statement, uh, please. Um, maybe we can start with Holger. Um, okay, uh, I think there will be some niche applications to, to start. I think we have seen lithium sulfur applications in the area of uh, pseudo satellites and, and something like this where really a big advantage comes from the high energy density. I think that is something where we see uh, uh, increasing progress, but um, uh, I think it will be more than five to ten years um, until we have lithium metal in the electric cars. Thank you very much. Celine, what's your statement? You have yeah, worked so, uh, Bühler uh, successful, so I think Bühler also has some ideas where this can enter. And I think we already have um, an example of uh, lithium metal in cars. <laughs> That's with, true. With the blue, with the blue, uh, blue car and uh, blue solution batteries. So I think it already exists, but uh, I agree with Holger that for other solid state systems that are currently under development, uh, there is still some some work to be done. Mm -hmm. And maybe then we can twist the turn as a last question to Alberto a little bit uh, more to the fundamental aspects. I think you have given very interesting insights into the SEI, artificial SEI formation, which many people work on. Um, so where do you see the most uh, interesting fundamental aspect in um, understanding SEI formation, artificial SEI formation, and which type of new techniques you see in science that can give deeper insights into this sort of not black magic, but very difficult uh, to understand uh, technology of compounds that are sometimes not even crystalline, amorphous surfaces, ill-defined, changing when the operator takes them out of the solution. And um, what do you think is the future for basic science in this business? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I, mean, I, I, I see right now that uh, probably the biggest chance to... Um, to to have a breakthrough at least for for automotive is to go <clears throat> for a, for an anode free cell. So, in my opinion, the the, the uh, fundamental research should um, at this stage uh, invest substantial efforts into um, uh, understanding ways to to really efficiently plate and strip um, lithium on um, on um, on surfaces, so therefore, again, maybe we could benefit from all the knowledge that we have acquired on um, on artificial SEIs and um, also translate this into um, anode free cells. And these are, of course, uh, um, particularly interesting also for, for all solid state batteries. And um, in terms of tools, what we lack at this point is um, in, in the solid state battery research, at least from my point of view, is uh, is the possibility to really access um, in-depth investigation of the interfaces. It's really difficult even to do post-mortem analysis on uh, all solid state um, batteries. So probably development of suitable tools, um, imaging or spectroscopy um, techniques um, in operando uh would uh would would promote and, and facilitate the advancement on this field thank you very much Adato. 
Okay, then uh, thank you for your statements. So I think these are sort of uh, complementary technologies that we have seen today in this sense, and um, but also competing technologies, of course, the lithium free and the lithium metal uh, anode. And I wish you three all good luck in uh, being successful with the implementation of these technologies. And of course, also advancing the field with uh, excellent fundamental research. And uh, I thank you very much for your excellent presentations today. I'm also very thankful for all the people who um, attended and also participated in the discussion. Thank you for your very intelligent questions and for the discussion. And I wish you all great health. I wish, wish you good success with your projects and uh, scientific advancements and company uh, advancements and uh, emerging, uh, developing the emerging markets for the, the battery field. And I'm very thankful also for to our host today, Rosalba and Anne, for organizing this seminar quite perfectly. I think everything went uh, very well. And with this, I hand over again to Rosalba. Thank you very much. It was uh, great to have you today. And um, please, Rosalba, the closing remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. So thank you uh, to all the three speakers for your great presentations and great insights. And definitely to Stefan for uh, moderating so excellently today and definitely thanks for the attendees. Thank you for the great interactions for all the questions that you posted. I'm really hoping you enjoyed this symposium and I just want to let you know that um, there will be a recording, there will be a link sent to all of the registrants so if you missed part of it because of your connection or anything or if you want to watch these presentations again in the next few days you will get a, a link with the recording. So I just want to give a couple of announcements now. Um, we do have, I hope you're seeing my slide, but you have, uh, we have a special con collection dedicated to this topic. So lithium metal anode and processing and interface engineering that is guest edited by our moderator, by, by Stefan Kaskel, together with Professor Kiang Chan and um, Andy Son. So you can check it out on our website. Here's a QR code as well. And yeah, there, this um, special collection is still open, so it will be updated in the next few months with the uh, new submissions that we are still uh, acceptance, accepting. And um, one last announcement is our next virtual symposium. It will take place on March 2nd, and this is dedicated to research beyond lithium ion batteries. Um, we'll have six speakers. This symposium is also organized organized by Chemistry Europe, but it is a um, joint effort between batteries and supercaps and Chem Electrochem. So we don't have the registration page up yet, so we're finalizing the, the schedule for that, but you can check out our hub from uh, Chemistry Europe because all the details will be posted there. So with that, I would like to again thank you all and wish you a nice uh, evening, afternoon, night, so thank you for joining and see you next time in one of our events. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.